Hi, Reality Riffing. Welcome to the Immense Grace Binge series. These are interviews that I have done in uh, the past um, season, 2019-20, of great women from all over the world doing incredibly powerful, esoteric, and magical things. So I'm very excited to share with you some of these profound conversations. I am overjoyed to be able to uh, introduce you to and or uh, be able to have the um, joy of having a conversation with the infamous, the famous Maria Wheatley, who is a geomancer, a mage, and really a priestess of the the ley lines, the earth currents, and the different uh, geomantic configurations of planet Earth, both etherically and also in uh, 3D, 4D, 5D dimensional spaces. We had a very fascinating conversation about something that I love to talk about and learn more about. Maria Wheatley is the foremost uh, at the top of her field around these configurations of sacred spaces and how they affect consciousness and how our magnetic frequencies as humans interplay with the Earth's magnetic frequencies in these intersections of ley lines and the sacred uh, spaces and temples and churches and and on and on and on that get built at these intersections. I hope you enjoy this fascinating conversation with Maria Wheatley. Hello and welcome back. We are very, very uh, pleased and graced to be um, welcoming Maria Wheatley to the Camp Grace stage. Um, she's an authority on the geodet uh, geodetic systems of earth energies um, and the creator of a, a, a druidic soul star uh, astrology, which traces the spiritual and interstellar heritage. And we are just kind of talking about um, these earth currents and and sacred sites and and all of your body of work so maria thank you uh, thank you for joining us thank you for having me it's great to be here and to be a part of all of this i'm thrilled we are too and um i would love for you to just kind of introduce people to some of these concepts of the earth currents and um the the way that you're looking at the cosmology if you will Sure. I mean, our ancient ancestors, especially, you know, about five and a half thousand years ago, when there was a big boom of uh, building ancient sites, by what was called the Neolithic people. And the Neolithic people worldwide recognized not just ley lines, but that earth currents can entwine ley lines and they can be male or female. And the female earth currents can be uh, like the triple goddess itself, new, full and old. So some of those earth currents can have immense wisdom. And then you get very, very deep water that is born within the earth and independent of rainfall. And that emits for a dowser like myself that can recognize a spiral energy pattern. And that's the power within an ancient site. So in a nutshell, our ancient ancestors looked for all these different types of energies at these nexus points that could link up worldwide from, for example, from Stonehenge to the pyramids and they placed their sights upon them so they could absorb the, the different types of energies there into the actual fabric and architecture of the ancient site itself. Wow. Um, I'm curious because I know you live down in the Stonehenge, uh, Glastonbury area. Um, what's your experience? Have you thread the tour? Uh, what's your experience of the that kind of earth zodiac there? Can you can you break some of that down for us? Yeah, it was Catherine Maltwood that really discovered the Glastonbury zodiac, you know, way, way back in the, the 1930s. And uh, it does seem to be that surrounding Glastonbury there is a zodiac, but much more and different zodiacs have been found throughout the British Isles. So it's not unique in itself. Mm. It's like there were other places with other zodiacs as well. But I think Glastonbury in that respect is quite unique because it's got what's called the Mary and Michael currents, as well as the St. Michael ley line flowing through the tour. So imagine this, you've got this huge straight line, 300 miles long, and Glastonbury tour is sighted on that. But the power in the land is actually the female 
current, Mary, and the Michael current that entwine the lay. We all know what the caduceus symbol looks like. If we say that's a lay system, then that's what goes through Glastonbury, the, the lay and the earth currents. And at Glastonbury Tour, Mary and Michael currents literally uh, meet together and they make love and they produce a symbol in the land that is absolutely beautiful and represents the fertility of the, of the land as well. So that's what Glastonbury is famous for in earth energy terms. And the reason why they were called Mary and Michael is long after the Neolithic and Bronze Age people had abandoned the ancient monuments, the Christians, uh, early Christians, more Gnostic Christians, recognized that the earth currents were male and female, and they placed on the, the Mary current churches dedicated to Mary, mm -hmm. Mother Mary, or Mary Magdalene, every eight kilometers around this huge entwining serpent-type like energy. And the same holds true for the Michael current. All the male churches were placed upon the Michael current. So that's one lay system that we have uh, here in the UK that is um, that Glastonbury is cited upon. Wow. And so in the yogic science, we talk uh, about this kind of the central channel of the spine being called the Shushmana. And then you have these two um, kind of currents that run up the spine um, kind of in this this uh, this infinity um, way, um, or you could call it a, a, a spiral, depending on how you're looking at it, um, a, a basically a double helix. Um, is that kind of how you're describing how these earth currents go around the ley lines? Exactly. You said it beautifully. That's where we're on the same page. And that's, that's it. It's just different cultures ex express it a little bit differently. You know, so the, the ancient British people uh, would see it one way, but it, it's all the same. It's a universal symbol. And what they did, in, in, especially in England at the power megalithic power centers, they placed the sites upon them to absorb it. But imagine this, on one part of one current, let's say it flows through an ancient site, like a, what's called a Neolithic long barrow, and that's a very ancient site. It's, it's one of the oldest in the landscape, and it's where the ancients built chambers. Some people think they're like caves. They go in there when they feel like mm, caves, mm. with a huge long mound that could be up to 390 feet long, a Neolithic uh, long barrow. And along there, the Mary Current, for, for example, could pulse in seven places. And that's where we can activate our chakra systems by interacting uh, along the axis line of the monument and allowing that energy to gently stimulate uh, the chakra system. So by the time you get to the top of the barrow, you're at the crown uh, chakra location. And that can be a very beautiful experience for a lot of people. And I've taken hundreds of people to that particular long barrow over the years, all of whom have uh, felt the, the high energy there. Wow. And, and so when we're like, when we're looking at current events and we're, we're heading up to the solstice and just everything that's, that's happening. We had a lunar eclipse yesterday. I mean, are you, do you, are you looking at these earth currents in terms of how certain empires have held power on the planet or use power? Is that part of your work? Yes. I mean, one thing that I'm known for uh, in the UK is I discovered who built the Neolithic sites. Mm. Because when you go to somewhere like Egypt or even Malta, you're familiar with Akhenaten built this, Ramesses II built that. Mm. They have their legacy. But when you go to somewhere like ancient Britain, there are no people. There's just the monuments. So there's right. just Stonehenge or Avebury. And in my research, what I discovered was the very early ancient uh, Britons had very elongated skulls. And, uh, and I've tracked, them, tracked some of them down to top universities and photographed them. So they didn't have the round kind of skulls that we've got today. And certainly they built Stonehenge. And when I visited one of the long, long skulled people, and it was a woman, I think she was the high queen of Stonehenge because she had such a prestigious burial. And when I uh, had some time alone with her in the museum, it truly felt like on her long elongated skull, there was two crown chakra points. There was definitely two points of like energy there. So I, their, their brains were bigger than, than ours as well. 
And so I feel that there was two cultures that built the ancient sites, probably worldwide. And the first civilization, if we may call that, because I don't think that they were, you know, uh, savages, they were uh, brilliant mathematicians, astronomers, yeah. Yeah. geomancers, surgeons even. Uh, so we're looking at two different uh, cultures that built the stone circles and another culture, the Long Skull people, that built the very first monuments. Interesting. Do you uh, do you go into the arena of uh, that Long Skull um possibly as some sort of hybridization from uh, interstellar um, civilizations? I'm very open-minded. I think really what we're trying to do is piece together the past in a truthful, loving manner yeah. to understand where we came from, to understand where we're going to. And, uh, and I feel I've got a little bit of part of the puzzle <laughs> sorted, yeah. but not the entire and that's where different disciplines like yourself and different people come in and then together i feel that it's up to humanity to solve uh, the the puzzles of the past and where we're going in the future i don't think it's down to just a handful of scattered authors you know yeah. that, uh, that do that and that's the beauty when gaia talks to us through her earth energies and through her, her lays, because that's how I found the elongated queen of Stonehenge. I did it through dowson and communicating with the earth energies. And then, you know, a whole story unfolded that nobody had heard about before in, uh, in England and, and throughout the British Isles. And I feel once we reconnect, you know, we reconnect to, to, to Gaia through the, through, especially through the earth energies, the ancient sites and places, but hey, you can do that in your back garden. <laughs> you don't yeah. need to go to an ancient site. Yeah, yeah. Um, if there's more high power there, then we can work with the particular types of energy to understand ourselves a bit better and, and the Earth's story and the Earth's Akashic records as well. We were just in Scarabray last fall uh, up in northern, um, on, on mm -hmm. Orkney, um, and, you know, I was reading a, a, a interesting cosmologist book around that, that they've connected that, um, that, uh, you know, civilization to um, Egypt. Uh, what, I anything there in terms of what you found? Well, I, I was the tour uh, leader for Laird Scranton. I think that's who you've read. He yes. uh, connected Orkney. Yeah, I, I know him very, very well. And uh, like I say, I've led his tour around Stonehenge and places like that uh, as well. We, we work quite well uh, together. So, yeah, I mean, when you look at these ancient sites, we need to think of them as universal. Yeah. We need to think that they were very, very cosmopolitan. So, for example, uh, further on down in South England, about five miles outside of Stonehenge, in a round barrow, that's the Bronze Age people, for example, Laird writes a lot about the Neolithic, yeah. uh, there was beads from Egypt, jet from the Baltic and uh, trade from Estonia. So you're, you're, I've got all of these different cosmopolitan ideas, just like a modern day city today doesn't have just one culture. It has numerous different uh, peoples to make that up. And there is no difference between Orkney and Stonehenge in that regard. And they were very, very close. And I discovered a huge ley line that links Orkney uh, near the Ring of Brodgar and the Stones of Stones, right the way down to Stonehenge. Wow. And it's not just a lay like that. It has planets associated with that. So Stonehenge would represent one planet, and you go all the way up, and then they have great circles going around them that represent the orbits of the planets. So that's a planetary lay system that, uh, that I, I discovered. And I know in Laird's work, He's, he's looked into the cosmology of, um, you know, tribes in Africa to try and piece together the puzzles of the past. Wow. And, and what, um, what planet is um, Brodgar? That is more like the 12th planet and beyond. Yeah, it was wild up there. Yeah, Or Orkney, uh, Orkney is, it's, it's a beautiful uh, island. Uh, and it is very lush compared to one of the islands on the West Hebrides, which are, they don't have trees, for example, and they don't have so much grass. So Orkney looks very fertile. 
And what's your, what's your, we're going to Iona in the fall to, uh, to do one of these women's retreats actually, um, that we're doing right now, but just virtually, um, what, any, any kind of thoughts on the earth currents in Iona? Oh yeah. Uh, Iona have, uh, had one of the ancient Druid calls, which means a college. And what happened was after, you know, the, the Christian faith came to places like o Iona and England, they would put the churches on top. That was a mandate from uh, the Vatican uh, to do that. And even right. the Vatican takes its name from the Druid uh, prophecies uh, and the Druid prophets that were called Vates, Vats. Right. Uh, Vatican Hill was one of the uh, ancient Druid shrine. But when we come to Iona, we come to a kind of, understanding that the uh, energies there tend to be quite female they tend to be uh, narrow in parts and then when they uh, hit smaller megaliths there and uh, other ancient sites and, and christian churches they become a bit wider so also with some of the earth energies there and the lunar uh, ley lines because if we think of ley lines as not just being a line you know on a piece of paper yeah yeah actually being uh, either male or female and if it's female it could be part of the triple uh, aspect of the goddess and like i said earlier it could be new uh, mother or crone and there's a beautiful crone energy associated with um iona mm. which is full of the wisdom of the past and the wisdom of the future because as i'm sure uh, we're aware that you know time isn't linear it's more like circular the, the two the past can be the present and the present can be the future so i think iona was a, a key in the ancient world to understand in wisdom and i think the core that was there the the druid college that was there uh was was highly important and that's what they were going to there for and also there's a lay network in, in Great Britain that was discovered in the 1970s. And it's like a grid uh, of lines going that way and lines going that way, creating a grid. And one of those lines goes right the way across England to Iona, mm. carrying a lot of uh, energy because it's going east to west, which is the natural rotation of Gaia. Anyway, it's like day goes to night, doesn't it, from east to west? Yeah. So it does have a reactivation line and it has some wonderful involution vortex energy, which opens up, opens us up spiritually speaking as well. So it has got a lot. It really has on a small island. Yeah. We have these amazing different types of energy that we can, uh, that we can work with and benefit from. And there's some good healing energies there as well so healing um so when we're looking at the 2020 we're looking at current world events and we're headed to the solstice and we know that the, these are very powerful times and there's a eclipse on the solstice there's eclipse yesterday how do we use the, the this language if you will this glyphic language of the the earth currents and the ley lines to really optimize and and balance and and actionize ourselves as as evolutionary humans the amazing thing what happens to earth energies at an eclipse and the ancients knew it because when it came to the mathematical astronomical encodement of Stonehenge, and I'm not talking about the summer solstice sunrise, that is so secondary to Stonehenge, mm. okay? It could register eclipses. And this was figured out by Gerald Hawkins in the 1970s. Mm. Well, he started in, in the 60s, actually, and he used a computer database to do that. The, the mathematical mindset of the Neolithic was far superior. And they were really wanting to understand eclipse cycles like the Seros cycle and the, the moon's metonic 18.61 year cycle. It was very important to them because when it's a, an eclipse, if it affects the locality of Stonehenge, I mean, something that's an eclipse in Africa isn't going to do that much there, but it will have an influence because there is no separation. Yeah. What happens is the earth energy is quiet and down. They go to literally still, so you can't detect them. And then a little while later, it's like the whole system, a bit like your computer, rebooting up. So if one is there for the reboot and one knows where to, you know, get the maximum type of energy from, then, then you reboot. 
uh, as well, but in a different way. Again, in more of a kind of uh, deeper understanding and connective uh, way. So that's one way we can work with, with Eclipse Energy. Mm -hmm. And that's what I think our ancestors were looking for. And in 1999, going back to the total eclipse in England, and we don't have them that much, so it's a really big deal yeah. in 1999. And I was part of the Dowson team back then to go to the line of totality and check what was happening. And other people and geomancers were in other parts of the country all testing. And then we pulled our data in to fully understand uh, the Earth energies and what they're doing. And it's just like the birds go quiet. Gaia goes quiet as well in that system. And it can be quite beautiful to be at one and stillness with Gaia in that hour. Wow. Did you, I actually didn't check this, but did you guys, you saw some of the clips last night? It was very cloudy here in England. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But you could, if it wasn't cloudy, you would have, you guys would have been able to see it. Yeah. 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 Did, Lunar eclipses, uh, you, you know, sometimes we, we do, we get really good, good views here and uh, it can be very beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Did you do anything last night? Were you, were you uh, monitoring any activity last night? Well, where I, I kind of get, uh, what I teach my dowsing uh, students to do is not just recognize earth energy through dowsing, but recognize it through your own kind of body hmm. and your own connection with Gaia and your own connection with like, you know, the, the, the goddess energy, the, the male energy and that sort of thing. And then you can start to recognize it with you. It's a great time to, as well, prior to an eclipse, to do a little bit of a good clearing, you know, and get a clear out the cobwebs and that sort of thing. And then be still in the, the eclipse hour and then reactivate what it is that you want for the forthcoming cycles. So, uh, and I've, I've discovered uh, solar and lunar alignments at places like Avebury as well, and how we can work with those energies at particular times as well. Wow. Where, the, I mean, I'm curious where you have been in terms of these sacred sites that you were really maybe even surprised by the, the energy or the frequency there. What's what's your top list? Well, I mean, every single site has a different type of. It may share common things, um, but it will have a, a different kind of uh, energetic signature. I think one of my favourite places, although it's become quite touristy now, as it were, is the Hypogeum of Malta. It's two mm -hmm. stories below the ground, built out of solid limestone. Limestone is a great conductor of energy as well. The masonry is exquisite. But what I love about Malta is there was, n in the native tongue of ancient Maltese language, there was no word for father. All of the temples there were dedicated to the goddess. So I, I like the, the hypogeum. Uh, done the new visitor center maybe i don't like that so much <laughs> but yeah, the actual, yeah. uh, ancient site i do then unspoiled places in france i think have uh, a gorgeous appeal and so do the unspoiled places of sardinia mm. uh, so I, I quite like those but when i was speaking at a conference in in america last year um in california there was, I got to visit some sites near Sedona, which I, I mean, everybody goes to Sedona, but I wanted to visit the sites near there, like Tudigud and Wupaki uh, and uh, the Verde Valley and have a look at their integration of earth energies. And it was quite a story to unfold because they were built in a very similar way to how the Templars encoded particular energies into their sites. Interesting. So I, thought, I thought that was, that it, it really took me by surprise because I wasn't, I wasn't thinking that until I saw the design layout of Tuzigut and went there and down the earth energies and decoded the place and realized the similarities. And I thought, you know, gosh, what's going on? So that's, Great to have a, a look around the ancient sites in America as well. Yeah, there's there's some really um, interesting. I mean, I, it's, I'm fascinated that you said the Verde Valley because that's where my husband's from. But we spend a lot of time there and it is a very uh, there's a high frequency of things going on. Yeah, 
I mean, that there really is. I mean, I loved my time. Uh, it was, you know, very, very special. And it is high energy again. It's a different the, to uh, the energies of Stonehenge, but it, it, it has its own signature there. Yeah. And you can tell why it was sacred and why the, the culture there wanted to build where, where it was. They recognized, again, the formula for sacred space that has been known, you know, five, five and a half thousand years ago. Some would argue longer, far longer than that yeah. so um, that's what we kind of I, that's what I do I go around looking at ancient sites and helping to decode them with um, with the earth wisdom that I have and do you so you know how do you feel because i know as a yogi that basically if we can if we can any way uh allow for the the proper channels of these energies through our own body mind system we're going to be less neurotic we're going to feel more connected um to all that is we're going to be more effective as human beings um, what's your take on the kind of the practical use of the this this these technologies the practical use, I mean, I, I come from a different culture. I mean, I'm a Druid. I'm a Druid priestess. Uh, I have done for some long. So so I'm steeped in the ancient Celtic ways, you know. Uh, but I, I love all uh, different uh, cultures. Together we come as one, sister to sister. How we can work with them practically is uh, I decided because being around a lot of male dowsers, God love them, one of which was my father because I'm a second generation wow. dowser. Wow. Well, you know, that uh, it's the people would say, oh, it's all touchy, touchy, feely, feely, you know, and, and go down that road. So I got some of the top electromagnetic uh, energy experts that could look at these earth currents and say, well, what is going on? Because I knew that they were making me feel very relaxed. Very ex uh, your aura expands on them. And, uh, and I always knew the stones had energy points that mirror our chakras. Yeah. Uh, so I went around to prove that. So with the chakras on the stones, there's always been in terms of energy, five above ground bands that kind of spiral around the stone and two are beneath that equate to our chakra system. And we got the hertz frequency emitted from the places where I doused and said, this is where the energy is and this is the energy spot here and here. And they put the equipment up and said, you know, that's coming out specifically where you're saying at 18 hertz. And one of the team members said to me, well, we, we, we here at 20. And I think what our ancient ancestors were doing was they weren't just seeing the stones, they were hearing it through having that slightly better frequency, maybe even in their long skulls or round skull people alike, and they could hear the, the sound of the stone. And they're very healing frequencies that come out. And the frequencies of the female energy current called Mary that prevails through Avery and Blastonbury, like I said earlier, yeah, yeah. well, she puts your brain naturally into alpha. And maybe wow. um, even, you know, higher states like that. So you've only got to walk within an earth current and then you, you feel much better. So on a practical level, what I have done with working with the earth's deep, deep water. This, like I said earlier, this is not water that is born of rainfall. It's not yeah. aquifer water. Yeah. That's detrimental to your health because of her frequency it emits. It's called geopathic stress. Uh, and... The healthy, deep, deep, deep waters that emit the spiral pattern called a geospiral, well, I, I realized that we can cleanse our body waters at certain points on that spiral pattern because I think it's not just our brain that holds on to memory. As homeopaths quite rightly tell us, yeah. water has memory. So I work a lot with the Earth's uh, inner waters and how to find pockets of those because they are very healing. But Gaia needs what's called her geopathic stress areas. And they're areas on planet Earth that emit negative toxic energy. And one is a grid system. And it was found in Europe by physicians and doctors that did dowsing. That if you're on the grid and you sleep on this particular grid pattern, you could have any healing modality that you like. You could have chemotherapy, radiotherapy, acupuncture. If you go back and sleep on that grid system, your body does not self-heal. Mm. And they realize 
and congeal your blood as well. So as a kind of dowser, what I, what I teach, especially now with uh, my online courses and things, is how to find these locations and keep people healthy. Because this is a shocking statistic. In Germany, over a seven-year period of studying these uh, toxic geopathic stress uh, lines compared to the healing ones, they found that a third of all hospital admissions uh, over that year, seven year period was down to geopathic stress. Hmm. It was down to the where that you place your bed, the where that you put your, your laptop and spend hours a day doing it. So, uh, so we can go to healing earth energies and we can avoid what's called the geopathic stress zones. Then we are truly living in harmony with, with Gaia and the planet upon which we live. Interesting. And and she needs these geopathic stress zones because it's like a way to clean in some way. This like is that is am I picking that up? Yeah, I mean it's a bit like how we need to get rid of waste in our own bodies. Yeah. 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 If Gaia has that too, because you know, like as above and so below, we we mirror Gaia in so many ways because like I, I say to to people, she isn't solid. She's not of earth. She has more underground water uh, than than the oceans. She has more uh, ocean water than she does land mass, mm -hmm. and she is fluidic. And so are we. If you break down what's in our bodies, we're over seventy five percent of water. And like I said earlier, I think trauma can be uh, kept within that body water. And there's a certain way that you can work with it ever so uh, easily. And then your body responds to the energy spiral pattern. And then you know that you've really cleansed up above those waters. And it's nice to do at a quiet site rather than, you know, a popular, a popular one. Do you feel like the, the White Spring has this healing frequency? Uh, the white spring water has a lot of calcium uh, in it, and that comes from aquifer water. Okay. So e even though that's not deep, deep, deep uh, yin water, as I call it, that's yang water because it's fallen from the sky, it is still very uh, healing, as yeah. is the iron waters, the red waters uh, opposite. But these days, if you take a very close look at white spring, it's actually being filtered through in copper now. Mm. Okay. Okay. And how about like, a, I'm curious what you think of these kind of cosmic vulva air, uh, uh, water areas like St. Nectan's Glen. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, again, that's uh, become quite touristy over yeah. the past uh, 10 yeah. years. And even yeah. at Tintagel Castle, you have 2000 people a day in high peak season go wow. through these places. Wow. They're, yeah. They're, 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 they're incredible. But yes, where you have that type of uh, water and you have like um, the, the water coming down, it creates a, a very sacred place. But that's because in Druidry, uh, we used to deposit, for, for, you know, literally offerings into water. That's what all the Druids did. That's what the Bronze Age people have been doing. So it's very much into our culture when we come to these watery places to give deposits. Very often they were swords. So that's where the whole Arthurian idea is, the lady of the right. lake, because right. they were always deposited. Uh, beautiful swords have been uh, found in the Thames and beyond that date to the Druid period of, of the Iron Age. So I see the kind of mythical landscape becoming the historical landscape that weaves Britain's holy history. And I've got a lot of the holy history of certain particular sites from the past life regression work that I've done as well. Mm -hmm. So I try to combine an, uh, a, a, a grounded academic approach because I've studied archaeology at Bath University yeah. and uh, continuing education at Oxford with more my mystical family side and my, my Druid background as well. So, and they, they do, they touch our hearts when we go to, to these sites as well. And um, yeah, the, the water was so important to the ancestors past here. Wow. Well, I could just talk to you for, for hours. I love you. You're amazing. Thank you so much for just everything that you're, that you're um, bringing together. It's really deep and quite profound. Yeah, well, I think, you know, what the ancient sites have taught me over, over the years, it's not just to go to somewhere to tick it off as like a bucket list you know, to, to go there and really uh, interact. 
and over here we have guardians you know of lays and things they tend to be in mythological terms yeah. big guardian dogs you know like anubis or yeah. cerbera yeah something along those lines so whenever you go down a straight line in the uh, in parts of england you'll come to the black dog inn the black dog pub right you know, right pound pub. And they're all uh, saying, remember the guardians, remember the guardians, and remember, you know, the fae, which are commonly called fairies, although they're actually pronounced the fae of the two Arthur de Danam, uh, Irish culture. So we have all of this kind of um, legendary past that is in the landscape uh, as well. So I, I guess, you know, the last thing I'll ask you is just um, any messages or anything that the earth has been um, kind of uh, telling you as we've gotten into these very um, pressurized times of 2020, anything that we need to know as women out here in different parts of the world doing really amazing work, the women of this community. We're all doing amazing through this. I really think we are all doing amazing. And what I got just before uh, lockdown, uh, I was at a, a beautiful ancient site. Uh, it's just down the road for me because uh, I'm so fortunate. I, I live near Stonehenge and Averyhenge, and I went there, and it was quiet. You know, I don't know. I felt like I had the monument to myself, and I really did hear the earth say, "Change, but necessary." Yeah. So uh, I, I feel that the more that we can adapt and change to situations, and especially God love you all in America yeah. with, you know, what's what's happening to you. Um, you know, we've we as Druids over here are saying our prayers. Only last week I was doing um, uh, sending out what we call the Oum symbols of Celtic times. That's ancient Celtic writing that has symbols. And we were project, projecting that to, you know, the the uh, disturbances that were there. But mm. I think if we can come through this with love, grace, beauty, and dignity, and uh, embrace the changes that are happening, we can rewrite our future. We're at a time now which hasn't been written. Yeah. Yeah? Nobody's written a story. They haven't written the next chapter. People like you are writing the next chapter. And, and everybody else that is adapting, we are the authors of our future. So I see it as, yeah, it can be scary. Change can be scary. But if we go into ourselves, into that kind of real embrace in love and, and Gaia, I think, do you know what? I think in a few years' time when we've written those new chapters, I think there's going to be some really positive changes. And we will know in our hearts that we were all, all of us, every single person in lockdown can make a difference in these hours. So I, I see the beauty and the grace therein. And these times will have merit and worth in the future. Hmm. Thank you so much. And um, I hope to connect with you again and connect with you in person when we're in Europe again. Thank you for, for uh, sharing all of that with us. It was very, very profound. Thank you very much indeed. Take care and um, we hope to meet you very soon. <laughs> okay then, cheerio then. Cheerio. Bye Maria. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of Reality Riffing. These are conversations that I think are important with people who are doing great things in the world about subject matters that need to be discussed. If you enjoyed the content, the conversation, please feel free to share with your people, share with your friends and family, rate the podcast below, and also subscribe.